So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this new webinar by the International Energy Agency under our Capacity Reinforcement Program on Energy Data and Energy Modeling. So um, it's been a few sessions we are discussing uh, energy modeling, and today we will continue these discussions, but not uh, from the IEA perspective, but from the, the perspective of um, an academic partner who is uh, Mark Owells, and we are very, very happy to, to welcome and lucky to have for this uh, session. So welcome, Mark, and thank you for, for your time. And um, so Mark um, has been has been working, and I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself more into details, Mark, but has been working in the uh, energy uh, field and doing a lot of, of modeling and academic research, but also practical work and a lot of uh, training uh, in uh, developing economies, including Africa, in this um, in this field so he has a lot of experience to to share with uh, all of you today just to remind where we are on our um, on our agenda um, so after having our first um, sessions on statistics and those on on modeling where we have looked at the different parts of the energy system uh, last week we discussed how to do modeling of the energy demand taking the building sector as an illustration. Then we looked at transformation processes uh, with uh, the case of the power sector. Yesterday, we discussed supply of, um, of energy so that we, we could get this um, comprehensive view of the entire energy system from end use sectors demand to transformation to, to supply. Uh, but the IEA is obviously not the only institution uh, thinking about uh, energy modeling. And there are many other um, great uh, universities, uh, in organizations, institutions with whom Mark has been very uh, involved and working uh, with. So uh, he will also be able to, to share their, their perspective on how they do energy modeling. I'm sure that many things will resonate with what we have discussed today, but there will be also some uh, maybe um, um, some different uh, point of view or some different um, uh, works that Mark can uh, can highlight. Uh, um, so we hope it will be of your of your interest. Today's session will last two hours. Sorry for the for the the mistake in the in the slide you can see. So it will end at 11 uh, Lusaka time. And uh, tomorrow we'll have uh, another session starting at nine and lasting two hours and a half. So tomorrow we'll be able to, to um, end at 11.30. And it will be uh, likewise uh, an academic partner who is Politecnico di Milano with also extensive experience on energy modeling, uh, which will present as well as their perspective on, on this topic. So I'm stopping here, uh, Mark giving you the, the floor. I know you, you are a professional teacher, so <laughs> you, you're very much and much more used to this uh, teaching side than, than I am. So I let you uh, animate and, uh, and uh, lead and drive the, the session as you, as you wish. And uh, I wish all of you a very good uh, session today. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, Ona. Uh, that's uh, very kind and a very kind introduction. So. Uh, we have a fair number of things to, to get through in the two hours. So I'd suggest that we, we have sort of uh, six uh, sessions, three with questions and answers right after, then we'll have a little bit of a break and then uh, continue. So um, that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, I want to be talking today a little bit about a set of material that's been developed with a number of, of different partners. And this material is available uh, for folk to take up, to use, um, <clears throat> and to develop further with the uh, IEA, as, as well as with other partners, depending on how this, uh, how this fits uh, or not. Um, and you'll see that there's teaching material, there are tools, uh, there are starter data kits, and so on, and those are set up as, as pieces to hopefully help make things uh, easier to get started. I'll start off maybe with a bit of background about myself and why I'm in this space and uh, why it's just such a privilege to work with folk like Ono and the IEA. I started off as a young academic at uh, the University of Cape Town in South Africa and South Africa when I got there, South Africa had had a democratic change and the government was very, very interested in getting a new 
integrated energy plan set up, something that was appropriate for the for the, for the new country. And you know, as a as a young patriotic uh, researcher, I was very keen to try and get uh, get these things together. And so, spent a lot of time uh, raising money and funds and teaching ourselves how to use some of these uh, tools that were quite expensive, actually, and very difficult to um, uh, to get on top of because the the expertise that was available was was really quite limited and so unless you could afford a lot you could spend a lot um, to get these consultants on board and pay for the software it was it was difficult to get going so we got on top of that we taught ourselves how to use it we developed the the country's first integrated energy plan and this is something that is now institutionalized uh, in the country and um, the University of Cape Town, plus uh, a number of other organizations, research organizations in South Africa can develop these, um, the, these, these, these models and so on. And these are really useful because they help understand what to invest in, when to invest in them, um, how to operate when they're invested. And then there are other things that you can do with that information, but that, that's really critical. Anyway, the takeaway was that it was very difficult to get it set up. We didn't have access to excellent activities like uh, this with folk like Anna. There were one or two things going on, but there were, there were it was just difficult. Um, after that, I moved to the International Atomic Energy Agency where, um, and you'll see some of their tools uh, part of this broader kit uh, in a minute where they were involved in building capacity in a number of countries and then helping to work out what would be, you know, together, helping to work out what would be the optimal energy development strategy for the country. And the thing that was really neat in the IAEA was the fact that, you know, there's a lot of effort to make sure that things are owned by um, the analysts and the processes are owned uh, by the country rather than consultants from the outside coming in, doing some work and disappearing. So very much uh, in the spirit of uh, this work by the, um, uh, the IEA. Um, one of the things that was really difficult though is that it became hard because we noticed that when people, we would work with excellent analysts, they would develop excellent strategies and so on. And then within a short period of time, many of them were, were promoted. If you were lucky, they were promoted in the energy ministry. And so then they, just, they were in a, in a place to argue for capacity for energy planning. But often they weren't. They might have disappeared off to um, some high level post elsewhere in, in government. And then that became, that sort of became a bit difficult because the tools that were available at the time, they were fairly closed. You couldn't get underneath the, uh, the hood of these tools. And it's the case that, um, you know, you almost then had to go and do another technical assistance uh, program to rebuild capacity because people moved on. It was difficult for the planning officers to have a, a sensible and um, pragmatic knowledge management uh, structure. And so moved to academia in order to start setting up open source uh, tools, teaching material, kits, and so on, and to do that in partnership. So with um, IRENA, the IAEA, the World Bank, and the IEA as well, so that these are these are sort of common goods that are available that people can use easily. And then when technical assistance happens, that can often be, you know, around the um, not around the mundane things like modeling and data. Um, and tool development and, and, and so on, but, but around the things that are perhaps a little bit more important. I noticed that Manuel Welsh is on this, on this call. Manuel is from the International Atomic Energy Agency. And he, uh, in fact, his PhD was involved, involved several things. Two of them uh, were taking two of the toolkits that we're going to show you today further than they are, uh, they are right now. And so it's nice to have uh, have Manuel on the call. Okay, so that's that's myself. So I moved into academia, set these up, started to set up these open source tools, and now in the in the phase where we're developing partnerships to make sure that the tools can improve, the data can improve, and so on. But also um, with 
and 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 coming up behind uh, international organizations like the IEA and others, you know, these things are just available. So hopefully, it makes people's lives a little bit, a little bit less difficult. So um, let me quickly uh, share my screen. I'm still. So just to, to let you know that the tools that we'll go through uh, for the moment are called Energy Balance Studio, um, the model for the analysis of energy demand, Osmosis and Flex tool, this is energy modeling tool, uh, FinPlan, which actually is something that Manuel looks after at the IEA, and then Clues, which is about uh, integrated planning. So making sure all of the planning uh, comes together and it fits it fits well. I also want to uh, draw your attention and we'll draw your attention uh, during the call to online resources that uh, are available. Uh, and those include, uh, let's go here, a, a full sort of pre-training teaching kit uh, that is available for folk to um, learn more about how to use these models and tools. So again, this is pre-training. So this is when you're done with this, you're in a space where you can use these things, but then it's really useful to be able to, in a technical assistance program, you're just in a, in a, in a space where it's much easier to engage. And instead of working with experts, trying to get some software installed on your computer, you can work with experts in developing the meat of, uh, of, of the strategies. And so the tools I'll talk about are all uh, online and you can take uh, pre-training courses on all of them uh, with the exception of clues. Clues will be online in a, likely in a couple of months. Um, then it's the case, and we'll look at this in a minute, that there's this, uh, one of the tools, the global electrification uh, platform is online and you can develop a whole uh, set of different analyses uh, really quickly. So let's just find uh, Zambia fast. We'll go back to this during the, the, the two hour session. And here there's, oh, I need to plug my computer in before it dies. Excuse me a sec. Um, and here what you'll do is you'll find um, electrification, you know, lots of scenarios of electrification for uh, the country. And as I say, we'll go back to that uh, in, in a minute. It's also the case that sometimes getting data together for a simple energy model can be really quite painful. It takes a lot of effort to get the right kind of data together in the right sort of form. So one of the things we've done together um, with various folk, and you see, Honor mentioned here, there are also some colleagues, I think, in there from uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency and IRENA and, uh, and a couple of others, is to put together a starter data kit so that um, while this is not perfect because it comes from international data, it's something that, you, that just helps you get up and running much faster than, than starting from, from scratch. And you can find all of the specific data uh, and so on in formats that are relatively easy to use and you can download them and, and so on. But we'll get, we'll get to that uh, a little bit later on. The key, the key point here is that uh, there are online tools, there's online um, teaching material, uh, and there's online starter data sets that are available for folk to uh, uh, to use. And these are put together in partnership. So I'm gonna spend the first uh, few minutes going through an introduction to Energy Balance uh, Studio. This is a very, very simple tool that was um, uh, developed by UN Statistics and the IAEA that is there just to help put together simple energy balance uh, information. This is, this is useful and, and, and we'll go through why energy balances are important uh, at the minute. I, I want to stress as well, that this is an extremely simple tool, um, but IEA have far more advanced approaches than this. And um, 
if you're working with them on developing energy balances, that's what they're doing is, is at another level. This is very basic, but very useful for introducing folk to the idea of an energy balance. Now, one of the reasons why we call this thing an energy balance is that energy is just one of these interesting things. In order, in order to get the services that we want from an energy system, it's the case that we require energy of some form or another. So if it's lighting, we'll either have uh, energy in the candle wax, we'll have energy in kerosene, or we'll have energy in the form of electricity going through um, uh, either a, a wick or a light bulb, respectively. Now, the thing is, is energy can't be created or destroyed. So you're going to have to, if you want to provide lighting, we know there's a certain amount of energy that absolutely has to be provided. You can't get away from it. And knowing how much electricity, for example, is required in light bulbs or for air conditioning or for whatever else, uh, we can, that tells us exactly how much needs to be transmitted. In turn, that tells us, and we know what the losses are. So in turn, that tells us exactly how much uh, needs to be generated. And in turn, that tells us how we need to operate our power plants and so on. And that's just for electricity. The same goes for, for transport. Uh, in order to move our vehicles or other things, we simply need uh, the oil or electricity that goes into those. And in turn, that means that we have to uh, supply and produce uh, enough, and then that goes into the, the system. So the whole system's in balance. Supply has to equal or, or be greater than, than demand. And so an energy balance is a useful way of uh, looking at at these things. Now, the IEA is super famous for being the go-to place for, for energy balances. They've done a terrific job in setting these, these balances up and populating them for lots of countries and so on. And because energy is just critical for doing anything, uh, setting up these energy balances is critical for understanding the energy system right at its basis. And thereafter, we can think about uh, thinking about managing it. So this is just a, a, a picture uh, de describing what I was talking about a little bit earlier on. So, you know, it's the case on the right hand side, you have all of these demands for the for for things that you get from using energy. So in this example, um, uh, this is heating, cooking and other residential needs like our light bulbs and so on. And then you can see the um, uh, the energy forms that have gone in to produce those, and then on the left hand side, where they come from. Now, again, this is this is just super important because if you cut off any one of these flows or other things, we simply cannot um, have the the, econ the social or economic activity that we want, which is why energy is just such a critical critical part of the uh, uh, the equation. Um, it's often the case though, that our demand for energy outstrips uh, supply. And so we have a large amount of suppressed demand for, for energy, and this can simply slow things, uh, slow things down. So energy balances can be really important for just a, a number of, of interesting reasons. One is, is that it's a standard. So as soon as you start to understand an energy balance, you can talk the same language as other uh, energy statisticians uh, elsewhere. And uh, this can be important. So you can see how your country is doing compared to other countries. And it also allows you to, um, to be systematic in the way that, uh, uh, that this is done. It's the case too that from energy balances, we can calculate a whole bunch of useful indicators. I mentioned earlier that if you cut energy off at any particular point in the economy, it can cause problems because you can't produce the um, the services that you need to run the economy, or to do other, or to do other things. And um, so, being able to understand where your system is vulnerable, or where it is, or various other things, you can use these energy balances to develop. Uh, indicators. So import dependence might be a um, an indicator of of its vulnerability. Another one that can be important is just to have a look at the, the efficiency of your system, and um, 
that is, be, and, and what you find is in many countries, in fact, this, a lot of this was started after the IEA started to put energy balance to, balances together in the in the 70s after oil crises and so on a lot of countries realized how vulnerable they were to energy supplies and then they started to look at the efficiency of their system and so many countries right now have a very efficient uh system and they can you can calculate what the value of that efficiency is with some other tools that we're we're going to be showing uh, a little bit later on and then also something that's important at the moment is that this can be a basis for calculating greenhouse gas emissions as well and uh, greenhouse gas emissions while a country like Zambia you know is in no way responsible for uh, the stress that's being caused by um, uh, climate change and you know is not still has a lot of allowance to go before it it emits anything like developed countries such as in, in Europe or the States or elsewhere have have emitted. It's the case that there are large gains to be had at the moment for um, going to lower carbon futures. And so to understand where we are now can be important into the future. And I'll bring this up again a little bit later on. One of the tools, for example, is used in a different developing country context. And you know, they're busy applying for hundreds of millions of dollars worth of concessionary finance to transform their energy system and or at least to invest in new low carbon uh, energy uh, production and so on and they can do that because there is this extra financing that's that's available but getting that financing requires a good structured a good structured start Okay, and just some, some various other, other things to bear in mind. So um, it's also the case that if we're going to have targets, and this is one of the things that makes energy planning so important, is that you know, we can have lots of qualitative targets in our policy documents and so on. You know, we want to have um, an efficient system. We want to have a low carbon system. We want to be energy secure. We want to be low cost and all those sorts of things. Those are important goals, but we have to start to quantify uh, things in order to have targets that we can uh, we can act on to understand where we're at and where we're going to go. So, uh, just to point out that that is that's that's critical. So it starts with the um, uh, the data. Um, there are various things that we could look at when putting an energy balance together. I'm not going to spend much time uh, on this because you can go through this with uh, um, slowly separately. This is just a, a quick introduction. Uh, also useful to have energy balances set up because you can understand and communicate energy situation with other governments, with energy industries, you know, to other important communities that you're accountable to and with international organizations. And in fact, I think this is part of various agreements and protocols that are in place as well. So it's a standard uh, and that can be, it can be useful. Uh, it's also the case that typically you want to be able to use these energy balances for different things. One is, you know, to get a, situ a picture of the situation now, but as you do your planning and you implement policies and so on, you want to see how things change. And this is a little bit like a, a doctor with a stethoscope. This is something that you can use to, to see how things are, uh, uh, are, are going. It's, it's the case, and we found this certainly when we were getting started, that it's infuriating when you get information from the energy sector from different places and from statistics folk and so on. And the units are different and other things are they're all over the place. And incorrect, um, incorrect definitions have been used and so on. So cleaning all of that up to get a clear picture uh, uh, is important. So typically you have to go out, collect data, do various things to convert this into the right kinds of units and then come up with uh, the energy balance. And there are various steps involved with the uh, the, the data collection, the unit conversion, uh, what their raw data looks like, and then shipping it into um, units that, that, uh, that are useful. 
Uh, there's a questionnaire that's useful that can be that can be used. There are various publications that you can get a hold of that are uh, free. Energy Balance Studio, which was developed with UN Stats uh, and the IAEA, is a tool which, as I say, you can go online and go through all the teaching uh, with that will give you enough just to get started. It simply helps put all of that together in a in a consistent way, and that can be useful. So just the first bits of this, um, the first bits of this uh, session. So number one, you know, energy planning needs energy statistics. It's really that simple. And an energy balance plays an important role in the process. You can't do sensible energy modeling without an energy balance. Um, and there are various best practices for, uh, for, for doing these. And there are some useful, simple tools. And then there are advanced methods, as I mentioned from the IEA that, um, you know, are, are just much, much better than anything else that's that's generally available. So this is just a, a simple intro, and um, and we note that this is uh, this is important. And you know, kudos and thanks to the IAEA for uh, allowing us to um, to use and develop use the tool and develop this this teaching uh, material that goes with it. So after, so we've done Energy Balance Studio. Next, we'll have a look at, um, next we'll have a look at energy um, demand projections, again, using an IAEA uh, tool that we're busy open sourcing uh, and so on to make completely publicly available together with the IAEA. But um, let's just stop there for two minutes and ask if there are any questions about energy balance studio and energy balances. All right, so if you have a question, please do just raise your hand. I think I can see um, either in the chat or um, in the participants uh, list. If anybody's got their hand up. Okay, I don't see any hands uh, up for the moment, but please feel free if you've got any questions or other things. As we go along, you can type them in the Q&A uh, box and uh, we can pick them up at the end of the session or just raise your hand at the end of the session if that's, if that's okay. So uh, let's move on. Uh, just to say this, this is the first in a series of lectures on energy balances. They're all free and you can pick them up and use them. And they're very much around pre-training. So I'm now going to uh, load up the, the next two presentations. These are very, um, these are two super simple tools. They're spreadsheet based uh, tools. When I worked at the International Atomic Energy Agency, it was the case that um, uh, I helped develop these a wee bit further. And so these are these are just tools that are used to uh, model energy demand going into the future. Okay, good, I can. So the first one is a tool called uh, the model for the analysis of energy demand, D, Myed. Oh, I have a question that I see has just popped up. Let's see. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll provide the links for these uh, these sites in, in just a minute. They're all completely free. And um, as I say, there's uh, teaching material along with it. You can download the PowerPoints, press play, and there'll be somebody narrating uh, everything in detail, and so those are uh, those are there. The other, we'll come back to the, the 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 course in a in a second. So we'll do that right after this. So, uh, Myed is uh, this tool that helps us think about demands for future energy. So we got this energy balance. We explained that you need energy for uh, all of these different activities. Now the thing is, is that it's the case that we expect the economy to change over time. We, we want the economy to, to grow. We want people to have access to more energy. Uh, well, we want people to have access to better services, 
more job potential, more, all of these good things. And behind that sits energy. And so this tool is used to help us think about where and what, what kind of energy is needed, where it's needed in order to have the kind of economic growth uh, uh, that we want. Now, this particular tool is thinking about the medium to long term. So anything in decades ahead um, is particularly useful for. And we need to look decades ahead because it takes a long time to build energy infrastructure and get things in place, including the financing uh, and, uh, and just the, the logistics. It's also the case that this particular tool is very much about trying to understand how the economy is likely to, uh, uh, to change over time. Okay, so what some people do when they're projecting in energy demand is that they will have a look at economic growth or have a look at how energy has changed over time or how much energy is required for a unit of economic growth. And then they'll say, okay, we know we need that much energy for every uh, increase every dollar of increase of economic growth. So if we want to grow a hundred times, we're going to need a hundred times the energy that's being used right now. And that's one way of doing it. It's the case, however, though, that depending on the industries that we're are going to be developed or the, the projects and plans for different things or the way urbanization and population are growing, then in actual fact, the demand changes a fair amount. And the, the better that your demand projection is, the, the better you're going to be able to predict how much energy you're going to be able to sell. And if you know how much energy you can sell in the system, then you're going to be able to set up things to make it just less risky for investors to come along and invest, whether those are internal investors or people from, from the outside. So you don't necessarily want to overbuild energy infrastructure if you're not going to need that amount of energy. And at the same time, a much more important, you don't want to underbuild your energy infrastructure because if you don't have enough energy, you're simply not going to have the economic growth that you want. There have been a number of studies. Uh, we did one for Zimbabwe, which I'll mention a little bit later on. They just show how many... I think it's trillions of dollars are lost in Africa each year because of unreliable energy supplies. And so being able to turn that around and make sure that demand equals supply uh, is just brilliant for economic, economic growth. So this is very much about looking at how to determine uh, demand. Now, there are, there are pretty much two basic equations that are used in this model. It's a very simple model and deliberately simple uh, so that you can go back and understand what calculations have been done where. So in the first one, it's the case that there's some energy demand uh, is a function of some sort of specific energy consumption multiplied by a driving parameter. Now, what this means is, is that let's say you know that for um, a mine that's producing a thousand tons of uh, copper per year, that there's a certain amount of energy, a specific amount of energy required to be able to extract that thousand tons of copper per year. And so you've got the energy required per thousand tons of copper. Now, the thing is, is there may be plans to further develop those copper mines, in which case, every time you increase that, the, the size of the copper mining activity, you multiply it by the specific um, uh, energy consumption factor, and we can figure out how much energy is going to be required for making sure those copper mines can run. Now, for sure, the specific energy consumption of those copper mines may well change as a function of the technology and other things that are being used. And that's okay, because what you can do is then uh, simply extend this and say, okay, this is, these are, you might divide copper mining into different categories, like new efficient copper mining or very deep copper mining or whatever the categories are that are sensible. And as you get more information, you can, um, you can make this uh, more detailed. So you can have more sectors uh, in there. But for a start, the specific amount of energy you require for copper mining will be quite different to say the specific amount of energy required 
per million people living in a city or other, other things. So this is the first set of equations. This is the amount of energy demanded as a function of some specific energy requirement and then some driving parameter. Another <coughs> equation, which is often the, the way everybody starts, is that you use a certain amount of energy for every unit of, um, say, GDP, uh, so gross domestic product. And this would be something called an energy intensity. So instead of specific energy consumption, you've got energy intensity. And so you could do this for the whole economy and not one, worry about the individual sectors. So for every unit of GDP growth, you need so many uh, million kilotons of oil equivalent of, of energy. So you can uh, figure that out. But the thing is, is that the more information you get, the more you can, you can break this up. And then we see that things like copper mines are relatively easy to understand because we know what future demands will be in terms of things like thousands of tons of copper produced and so on. But for GDP in particular sectors, if we break those up, we also see an interesting trend. So you use a different, different amount of energy for every unit of GDP. So you have a different energy intensity for every unit of GDP that comes from say commerce, a different amount of energy from every unit of GDP that comes from say agriculture, and a different unit of energy that comes from every unit of GDP from another part of the economy. So with this information, knowing how we want our economy to grow, plus the specific energy consumption or the energy intensity, we can then develop pictures of how much energy our economy will need in order to meet those, uh, those growth targets. Okay, um, and it's just the case that our, our economy can change. So the energy we use now for every unit of GDP, for every unit of economic growth, that can change into the future because just the structure of our economy is going to change. If um, Zambia, for example, were to just develop like lots and lots of copper mines and have a very mineral intensive uh, development uh, trajectory, that would look extremely different to if Zambia were to be putting lots of money and effort into uh, education and its IT industry and its um, agriculture or, or even um, uh, tourism and so on. So depending on the picture of the future that you want, you'll require different quantities of energy. And as I say, getting this matched up is really good because if you know what you're going to be demanding, uh, then you know what you need to supply and then you can make it just much, much easier for um, uh, much, much easier for reducing the risk of supply investments. Um, yeah, just to say that there are a number of these things, a number of these uh, elements are predefined inside of uh, MIDE. Um, so for example, agriculture, construction, and so on, it may well be that uh, we can use particular driving uh, parameters, transport as well, divided into, for example, passenger transport, where you're just moving people around versus freight transport. And these have different energy intensities. Uh, depending on where your households are, you might use energy for different things like heating, cooling, cooking, water water heating, electrical appliances, and so on. And that can be a function of the number of dwellings. It's also the case that these change drastically over time. As soon as people have access to electricity, they often switch appliances. And depending on the reliability of that electricity, uh, they'll use that for essential or non-essential services. Uh, you know, we also want to look at the service sector and so on. So there are, there are a set of sectors that have been defined. Uh, and then these are broken down into more detail. You can go into as much detail as you want to uh, with uh, Mayad, starting from something super simple, going into something that's really quite complicated. And um, what's nice about this tool is that because you can start super simply, you don't need to wait until you've got perfect data to get going. You can, you can improve things as you uh as as you go along and there are various rules of some that you can do for aggregating or disaggregating uh things into more or less detail so here's a picture of something that's disaggregated into a into a fair amount of detail which can be 
uh, can be useful. So again, typically you uh, you get information from your energy balance. So make sure your base year is correct. Then you think about scenarios, often going to the finance ministry or others to say, look, you know, how do we think the economy is going to develop? Uh, we use these simple equations and this very simple spreadsheet-like model, and then produce uh, uh, produce demands. You know, and then again, this is something that um, can be iterated uh, iterated over time. Some of the basic information required for the scenario developments: of GDP, demography, how we think lifestyles are going to change, uh, efficiency changes, and so on. And these can change quite a, quite a bit. So um, again, nice that you can start simply because you don't need all of this information, but really neat that you can develop it into as much detail as you want for the energy projections going, going off into the, uh, into the future. And you can develop different types of projections as well. So low, intermediate, high, and, and see how, that, see how those, uh, those pan out. Interestingly, it's the case that um, some countries will have relatively high scenarios just to, they will play with high scenarios just to understand what the potential requirements would be if they were to aggressively follow uh, different development paths. And for some reason, sometimes finance ministries or economics ministries don't understand the relationship with energy as well as they should, because they may have uh, incredibly interesting plans, but have not worked out the energy requirements. So then you don't get a projection of the demand and you don't know how much you supply you must invest uh, into. So again, we'll stop, we'll stop off here for a second and then I'll take questions and so on. There was one question about, um, about are, the, are the URLs and links and so on available for all of this stuff. So uh, yes, there are. So I'll just copy this right now to answer the uh, one question here. So hopefully you've got that in there. This is a, a link to all of the, the teaching material. Um, and where you'll be able to get a set of good basic uh, information would be, uh, how do I type this in? Uh, I'll, I'll put it in the, in the chat, is um, a, a website called www.climatecompatiblegrowth.com. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen there for a second and just type that into the, uh, into the chat. And from, from here, you'll be able to get access to all of the stuff that we're developing. Also, just want to mention that, you know, this climate compatible growth program is, a, is very much a partnership. We don't really produce anything without working with partners. And the reason for that is, is that Often our partners are very much in the business of, you know, doing deep technical assistance and, and so on. And if we can help in the background simply by producing material that makes life easier for folk, that's, uh, that, that's really very useful instead of reinventing things. So if I can ask, if there, are there any more questions? at the moment. So I think I can see hands if anybody raises a hand or um, uh, happy to answer in the, in the chat. Okay, I don't see any hands at the moment. So we'll go on to the next, um, uh, the next presentation very quickly. And this is, uh, I'll spend just two minutes going over this one actually. Uh, this is, a tool that you can ship onto the side of Myed called uh, Myed EL. And you'll see why that's important in just a sec. Oh, I've got a, another question. Sorry, I couldn't see the website. Okay, is it free or do we need to uh, buy licenses? So the, the website, I think, 
Ah, sorry, I think I passed this on to Arna, not to everybody else in the. So let me just type in the website. Uh, compatible growth dot com. Okay, so you can go in there and you'll find most of our material uh, up up there. Uh, let me just copy in a couple of things very quickly into the, the the chat forum as well, so you have access to them now. But this is all uh, this is all available. Uh, where are we? Excuse me. Yep. Sorry, Anna. Okay, I Anna came in and out there. I can't hear him right now, but if you can hear me. Um, uh, just to mention, so that these things are in the, the chat forum. None of the tools, all, all of the tools are free, by the way. So uh, you don't have to buy licenses or uh, or other things uh, for those. Oh no, you had a had a question. You're on mute if you did. So I, I can't hear you right now. Okay, I'll keep going with, okay, what's the latest version of MIDE, which year and how to get it? So fortunately, Manuel's in this um, in this presentation, so he can answer that for you directly. But if you go onto the website that I showed you with the uh, open source teaching material, uh, it gives you instructions for how to download it. And it's the latest, uh, the latest version. So I'm just going to uh, repost that into the um, into the the chat uh, thing in a second. Uh, you'll get the um, all right. So so in the chat thing, you'll get access to all of the courses uh, and so on. And over time, the um, you will find in the next few months that uh, Mayad will become completely open source as well. So, uh, but that's a discussion happening with the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, separately. All right, I'm just seeing if there are any other questions. So, couldn't see the website. Hopefully, you can see the website now. Uh, Arno is going to send everything as well. So thank you very much for that, Arno. Do you need a, a light? Okay, so I think we've answered all of the questions that were uh, that were there. Okay, so um, what we'll do is we'll move on now to uh, the next quick presentation on MIDE EL. Uh, again, if you go onto the course, you'll find instructions for how to download it and get it and so on. So again, uh, this is free. One thing about the courses is that you'll get a certificate if you complete them as well, which I would strongly suggest working through to uh, uh, to get. So um, MIDE EL is an add-on to the MIDE tool, and it's very simple. I just want to go through a couple of things because there'll be more important things to um, go through during this presentation. And all that it does is it helps us to think about the um, all that it does is it helps us to think about the demand profile that results from different energy demand projections. Okay, and by demand profile, I mean the hourly demand for electricity, uh, the hourly demand for electricity, and this can be important. Again, if you're running a mine. And for some reason, people get this quite wrong, and it's um, it's it's a bit annoying. Um, 
you know, sometimes people will say, oh, the cheapest electricity in the world is solar power. Um, and therefore, you should be able to develop all of your mining with solar power. And it's not that simple. Solar power produces, right now, it produces extremely cheap electricity during the, uh, the sunny times of the day. And it is extremely cheap. This is much cheaper than anybody thought it would be. But a mine is going to require energy um, 24 seven, you're going to need to be able to get oxygen, or get air to, to miners to provide cooling, to make sure that the environment is safe and so on. So very important to know what the demand profile is for the energy, for the, the, the economic sectors that you anticipate uh, being able to uh, support into the future. And it's different for different things, yeah? If um, you're driving around a car or you know, you're in a minibus taxi or uh, you're in a truck or whatever the case is, you can fill it up with petrol, diesel. That's really quite cheap to store. It doesn't cost much to have a storage tank, but electricity is not cheap to store. So it's very important that we know what the demand looks like so that supply can meet it uh, at all times. I'm going to skim through this really quickly. And so here, for example, is a, a diagram that points out the, the conundrum that you can have. On the left-hand side, this is what the demand for any electricity might look like. On the right-hand side, here's some production from a solar power plant and from a wind power plant. And the two, if the two don't match, you're not going to be able to uh, keep the economic activity going. Even if you have enough uh, on a daily or annual basis, enough electricity to, to meet that demand. So getting this demand profile is really important. And then in other tools, it's the case that we'll uh, have a look at things like storage and load flexibility. So uh, MIDE EL basically it helps you to reconstruct this, this fairly detailed, uh, detailed picture. Some tools then convert that into something called a load duration curve and use that for their, uh, their planning. But essentially, after you've taken your MIDE study, you would, um, you would uh, then go on to, to develop an electricity profile. And it's really quite similar. Again, you have a look at all of the different demands, the, the, bottom, the bottom part of this diagram, and you start to add them up. So when you've got your scenarios of how much copper mining, how much agriculture, how much commerce, how much other things that you're going to be doing into the future, uh, you apply um, a demand profile to each one of those different sectors, add them up and produce uh, the profile into the future. So you've got to know what's happening in terms of overall economic or overall growth in those sectors. You've got to know how the, the seasonality of those vary. So for example, you might not need, you, you may need to do heating in winter, but you're not going to be doing it in summer. So there's a, there's a different seasonal profile for uh, for different things. Similarly with agriculture, it's the case that depending on the, what season you're in, planting, harvesting, uh, and so on, you'll require energy at different times of that season. And then it's the case that during the week, you'll have different demand profiles. Many industries uh, slow down on a Sunday, let's say, if that's a typical day that you, you have off. If you're in the Middle East, it'd probably be on a Friday. But some industries don't vary by week. So the, the mining that I mentioned often operates 24 seven as well as other industries too. So, um, and then there's the variation during the day in a household often is the case. If you're in an urban household and you're working in the city, you know, you may turn lights on at a particular time, get the kettle on to, to make some tea or coffee and stuff and then disappear uh, to, to your job. And so there might be a, a spike and then it drops down and then you come back home um, and all of a sudden you're doing different things. Maybe you take a, a, a beer from the fridge or you watch some television or you're doing extra work in the evening and your lights and other things will go on uh, again. So there can be different variations by hour. And again, this varies from industry to um, commerce, to households and so on. And when you add all of this up, these loads can become quite different. I was sort of surprised in, in South Africa where we, I did work on some of the world's deepest mines, uh, that the consumption of electricity or the demand for electricity changed quite a bit depending on the season. 
And this was simply because you needed to cool air and compress air and get it deep down into those mine shafts. And there's a, uh, uh, you need a lot more electricity on a on a hot 30, 40 degree day than you do on a cold uh, winter day, and so on. So these variations are all important. And again, you come out with the uh, hourly load curve. Uh, and that hourly low curve, then you can go back to the electric, to the supply modeling and figure out what fits. Um, this is just a graphic that I'm not sure is as clear as it could be, but basically it shows you what um, that future demand can change as a function of how the, or the demand profiles can change as a function of how the system changes. So you don't necessarily see this super well, but there are there are in fact some important differences between the production or the demand of electricity at different times here as a function of you know, how the economy was, was growing. And if we know these well, again, it simply helps us because we can, um, we can supply, we know how much electricity we're going to sell. And if we know how much we can sell, we can make more secure agreements and make investment just much less risky. Uh, the mathematics, uh, looks intimidating, but this is really quite uh, quite simple. So basically, this boils down to going back to the number of weeks in a year, day type, seasons, uh, so on, hours in a day, and you do all of this stuff, add it all up, and uh, we come up with the uh, the information that we require. Um, here it is in a less confusing <laughs> di diagram. So you're looking at growth, seasons, variations by day variations by hour and then you get the the total and you just add these add these up and it's really simple and it's a spreadsheet tool and again this is available for free on that course or directly from uh the international atomic energy agency so we'll stop there that was just a, a very very quick um uh, a very a very quick introduction to my el so again if there are any questions just let me know. Otherwise, we'll we'll dive straight into uh, two other tools. So these are probably the core. Uh, the first one is probably the core tool that uh, we think is most important for developing uh, developing strategies. But of course, that has to sit on sensible energy balance data as well as energy project projection data. And again. Um, really important to be able to draw on communities that are there that can provide uh, support. Okay, so I don't see any questions at the moment on that. So let me just load up this next one. So next we're going to have a look at an open source um, medium to long-term energy planning tool. Now this particular tool has been used in a lot of different settings. Oh, okay, so the last time somebody used Maya, it was an Excel, what now? So manual can come back to that, but there are there's an Excel version and there's an online um, web-based version as well. So, or not online, there's a, there's a web-based version as well that you can uh, you can look at, but both of them have exactly the same ideas and principles. And what's nice is, is with this teaching material, uh, you can you can go through and brush things up. But it's the the browser based version, let's say, that is being being used at the moment. Okay, so let's see if there are any other questions. So no, that's it. So let's go back to. Um, Try to share my screen very quickly. Okay, so next we'll uh, we'll jump into um, energy modeling uh, in particular. Now, energy modeling is sort of the bit where you start to think about how you're going to supply that electricity demand into the future, how you're going to supply um, oil, uh, fuel, wood, and other demands into the, into the future. And we typically start off by looking at these demands, thinking about how to get the energy to those demands, how to convert it, and what energy resources to use. So that 
the simple energy balance that you saw earlier on. This is about taking that and understanding how that may look into the future and all of the bits in between. So all of the infrastructure that needs to be invested in and different configurations of the system that may or may not work. Uh, this is one of my favorite bits of, of analysis, by the way, is to try and understand this well, because if this is put together sensibly, you can end up with very low cost energy, which accelerates economic growth. You can end up with um, you know, lower carbon energy, more secure energy, and all of these different, uh, different things. But it's the low cost that's important. It's also the case that we can look not just at the supply. So we see um, on the left-hand side, we're just looking at electricity in this picture, but this goes, this equally applies to all other energy sectors. On the left-hand side, we look at supply. On the right-hand side, we can look at demand as well. And it's the case that it's this combination of demand and supply that provides the services that we need for economic and social growth. And there is a bit of a revolution happening on the supply side, because things like solar power is just becoming really, really, really cheap. Uh, and on the demand side, it's the case that uh, appliances are becoming potentially much, much more efficient. And the more efficient your appliances, uh, often the cheaper the service and the less energy or, or electricity that you need to uh, need to produce. So I have a hand up. Um, whoever raised their hand, where do I find you on this? Sorry, it, uh, I can't see. Uh, I'm just trying to uh find out who raised their hand so i could let you let you chat and ask the, the the question but i can't see who it was that raised uh their hand okay muaba matimba i think you uh raised your hand do you have a have a question you should be able to to ask it now can you ask your question Okay, for some reason, I, I can't hear you at the moment if you're asking, and it might be a problem on my side. So, hang on. Uh, let me just see if I can. Oh, no, could you try and unmute Mwaba Matimba? Okay, unfortunately, I can't hear anybody right now. Okay, if I could ask, if you have a question, perhaps you'd be so kind as to, okay, very good. Just put it in the chat and we can continue. Okay, so just to say there's a revolution happening at the moment and that is at the, there are things that are changing in the supply side, they're becoming cheap, but also things that are changing on the demand side that are becoming cheap and efficient as well. So uh, for example, uh, right now at, at my house, I made a point of buying, we, we moved to the UK not long ago. And so I made a point of buying some very, very efficient appliances and small ones as well. Like I like to have a cup of coffee in the morning. So I have a small kettle, that uses a small amount of power that produces just enough coffee for my wife and myself. I, I have two little daughters. The last thing I want them to do is drink coffee. They're hyperactive already. So it's just for my wife and myself. And I find that um, with this efficient little kettle and other things, I use a lot less electricity. And this is just a little kettle. But if you go onto other appliances and more energy efficient systems and industry and mining and so on, the amount of energy that's required can be reduced significantly and often at um, uh, often very economically. And so actually in South Africa, I ran a, a national energy efficiency campaign for a short period of time. And what we, what we labeled it was energy efficient, it was a 3E campaign for energy efficiency earnings 
because um, the earnings were, were good. Okay, models provide a simplified representation of reality. They help us to understand how these different futures can be um, developed. They don't predict the future, they give us insights about the future, but these can be important. So if we know how our economy is going to develop, or we know how we want our economy to develop, we know what energy supply and uh, appliance combinations we're going to, to need. And with models, we can construct the least cost way of getting there and make a very sound business case. We want to do this in the least cost way of doing that because we have limited money. Uh, at the same time, the lower the cost of producing all of this, often it's the case that you just need to attract uh, less investment and people can, um, and that can be secured uh, more easily. There are different types of models that are out there with all kinds of different um, uh, attributes associated with them. In this case, we're looking at sort of medium to long-term uh, models that um, will look 10 to 30 to 50 years into the future. And again, it's the case that uh, we do this in order to understand what to invest in, where, when, and how much to operate it. And we need to look decades into the future because you know, building a power plant can take um, a few years. So we need to know in advance um, what we're going to be building so we can get our market structures right. We can start to organize uh, power purchase agreements. We can start to think about how to get the financing right. And we can start to get all of the logistics right for building these, uh, uh, these new plants. Uh, it's a case that this normally fits into some sort of iterative process. Different, different people will do this differently, uh, but essentially we've got projection of where we want to go to. We use the model to figure out different configurations. We look at those configurations. Sometimes they make sense, sometimes they don't. The model's just a, an agnostic picture of its view of the world, but it may be that there are realities that we need to consider. It may not be possible to shut down an old coal fired power plant quickly. So although the model will say, oh, just shut it down and build a new one or uh, retrofit it or so on, there might be constraints and we have to put those into the model to understand what we can and can't do. But important thing is, is that these are, these are iterative things. Now, osmosis, the model that we're looking at, looks at sort of long-term stuff uh, into the future. Uh, by the way, this comes from uh, Manuel Welsh's uh, PhD, actually. So we have these long-term models. They look into the future, 10, uh, 20, 30, 50 years into the future. But it's the case that, you know, there's short-term analysis that needs to be done. So once we've got all of these power plants and other things operating, because the renewables are intermittent and demand can change, it's the case that we need to understand the flexibility of the system. And um, in this toolkit uh, that you've got, there's a tool called Flex Tool, which you can then run to make sure that the system is flexible enough uh, to meet its demands. And this is another um, completely, these are both completely open and free tools that, um, that you could work with. Again, it's the case that you collect the data, you do the modeling, and then you interpret uh, interpret the, the results. So Osmosis is the open source energy modeling system. It is a completely free and open tool. It has been used by a number of countries to develop their long-term energy strategies, their long-term emission strategies and other strategies. And so um, uh, a nice example is just recently, Costa Rica developed a completely open approach to collect their data, to do their projections. They ran a number of scenarios in osmosis to look at what investments they needed to invest in. So what power plants to invest in when and how to operate them. They also looked at electric vehicles because they could, uh, if they let the model run, they saw that using electric vehicles for certain types of trips, not every type of trip, of course, uh, was just much cheaper than using, um, than importing gasoline or petrol and losing a lot of money to the economy. So 
Uh, they also use this tool to look at the deployment of electric uh, motorbikes and, and other vehicles. And so with this, they developed the energy policy. With the energy policy, they've gone to the Inter-American Development Bank for various loans based on this planning. And uh, then they've gone further and gone to the global uh, environmental facility and um, are busy now applying for a very large amount of loans for new infrastructure and so on. So this sits at the heart of what they've been doing. And there are various others. So uh, the government of Cyprus, for example, uh, uses, uh, uses osmosis. There have been various analyses for the World Bank for different African countries and Africa as a whole. Um, it's also used in an integrated modeling system, which we will spend a few minutes uh, looking at shortly. And then, um, you know, for some of these global negotiations and climate change meetings and so on, there are global osmosis models that are used as well. I'm uh, mentioning, I'm talking about osmosis, but this flex tool is really quite important. It's developed by the International Renewable Energy Agency. And this has been developed specifically so we can, when we develop a picture of the future, we can go back and test it and see whether or not this would work. Um, so if we have lots of renewables in the system, uh, can we operate other parts of the system flexibly enough to cope with them? Uh, cope with that renewables or not? And do we have to do other things? And again, this is this is really important because there's a lot of noise about renewables at the moment. Some of it is really good noise. Some of it is misleading. And, um, you know, you're tasked with making, you'll be tasked with making sure that the lights don't go off and the economy grows. So making sure that this balance is done properly uh, is important. And strangely enough, if it's done well, you can end up with very high levels of renewables operating really well with hydro and other assets in the system and just end up with a much lower cost system. Done incorrectly though, and you can end up producing more electricity than you need from the renewables. You're not able to absorb it in the system and it has to be, it has to be wasted. So uh, that's important. Um, for osmosis, it was the case that we had a, a, a browser-based a browser-based uh, interface. We've changed this now, especially for this online for this this teaching uh, material. So there's an Excel-based uh, spreadsheet that's ready to go, and you can uh, very quickly put in some. I think it's about 200 technologies and 50 different energy types, and different types of emissions, and so on. And this is. Uh, this is free to use. It's completely free, completely open. The only issues are, and quite important, is that you'll need Microsoft Office because it uses Excel and Access, and that's fairly standard. The other is that um, it's best to have a computer with at least eight gigabytes of RAM. Uh, if You can do it with smaller, but it just takes way too long. Um, and then the last bit of information that's useful is this comes with a very powerful free solver. Now, in the past, you would have had to have spent anything from $20,000 to $100,000 for, uh, for this sort of setup. And that is now uh, available completely, completely for free. And again, everything's uh, online. So I mentioned this already about the, uh, uh, the Flex tool. Uh, which is which is there, but important because while osmosis will tell you how much to invest in when and and how to construct the energy system as a whole, it's the case that um, the the flex tool will help you think about how much flexibility you have in the supply system, potentially how much flexibility you have in the demand system, and uh, and match those up. Uh, maybe one thing worth mentioning is that. It's already the case that we're seeing the electrification of um, motorbikes happening in different parts of Africa and happening quite quickly as well. And so being able to understand and be able to um, know what the implications of that could be is critical. So if all of a sudden there are lots of electric motorbikes in your system, this can be really good because you're not importing the gasoline. And the overall cost of ownership is lower. So you're, you're providing a cheaper transport service, which you know, for 
motorbikes and little three wheelers that are doing local jobs but for small businesses that can be that can be really important but again uh, being able to think about what that means when are people going to charge it do you have reliable suppliers or not and if the tariffs are set up so that they're very very cheap when there's a glut of renewable energy in the system that can be helpful because you can have uh, not just flexibility on the supply side with a hydro system, let's say, but also uh, potential flexibility on the demand side. And Flex2 will help you work through all of that. I thought I'd just pick out a couple of examples of some recent work that has been done. So Osmosis was used in Zimbabwe for the World, uh, World Bank uh, very recently. And uh, this was done because uh, Zimbabwe has... Uh, a set of NDC targets, many of them revolve around hydropower, but as you'll know, uh, the Kariba um, hydropower system has in the, has in the very recent past suffered uh, very bad um, water, water shortages and so on. And the point is, is that unless we look at scenarios of what that water might look like into the future, we may commit a lot of, um, and in Zimbabwe's case, they were going to do this, commit a lot of investment into that hydro system, but that could all become really vulnerable into the future because yeah, if you don't have enough water, you're not going to be able to produce enough electricity. And so what we did is we worked together with the government to say, okay, well, we know that the climate can be, can be unpredictable and there can be these prolonged spells with not having enough water. So can you use the hydro system, not just for producing bulk electricity, which is great, but also use it to be able to um, do balancing. So you, uh, you get your solar power systems in place, which are now super cheap. Uh, they generate electricity during the day. During that time, you fill up the reservoirs because you're not using the hydropower. And then in the evening or other times when, when it's needed, then the, you have the hydropower running and so on. So you change and, and you change the way um, the hydro system is rewarded. So instead of a, a power purchase agreement for you know so many kilowatt hours of electricity, it can be an agreement for um, a monetary value of that sort of storage or balancing as it's called an ancillary uh, service market plus the uh, electricity sales market. And depending on how things are connected, when you do have surplus that can be sold on the spot market into the Southern African power pool. Anyway, it was just a, this particular analysis was just about taking Zimbabwe's NDCs and climate proofing them a little bit by changing the way that the system was structured and operated. And what we find is, is that it's potentially much lower cost and much lower emissions to, um, to look at new hydro investments in a way and this might cost a little bit more, but to uh, be able to operate them more flexibly than might have been done uh, in the past. So in order to help, um, we've developed these starter kits for osmosis models for every African country. We're busy with every Latin American country and every Asian country right now. Uh, these are developed with the International Energy Agency, International Renewable, uh, Agency, International Atomic Energy Agency, and a whole number of others. So these are put together, and they're put together in a way to simply try and make getting started easier. They also come with a, a very zero-order turnkey model that you can uh, use if you wish to. So there's a picture of the reference energy system of the model on the right-hand side. Also, all completely free. And on the left-hand side, a um, this, this comes from one scenario. Um, that was run inside of uh, inside of uh, osmosis, just so you could see it. It comes with a few different scenarios that you can play with, but these are very much zero order, um, you know, energy models, zero order data sets. But experience has showed that it often takes months just to get the right data into the right format and so on. And um, so, so we 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 did that to start off with, but it really is zero order because. You know, international data never reflects uh, exactly what the situation is on the ground. So we don't we don't go around shouting and saying, "Oh, we've got a Zambian energy model." 
uh, at all. Uh, this is very much a starter kit and so on, and it's there for people to pick up and develop and 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 use, but um, done so that uh, hopefully it reduces the amount of uh, pain that people have to go through to start uh, start these uh, start these modeling exercises. Okay, so I'd like to uh, stop off there just for. Uh, a couple of minutes and I realize that we've been going constantly so maybe let's have a we'll have two minutes for questions if there are any questions and then uh, maybe we have a five minute break and we can go on to the last two uh, the last two tools so are there any comments or questions that, that folk would like to ask All right, well, while, um, while folk are thinking, I'm going to, uh, again, uh, share my screen. And I wanted to show you something else. And so uh, while you can get a hold of all of the teaching material here, you can get a hold of the starter data kits here. And there's a description of where all of the data comes from and so on. Another thing that can be useful is that there's a big um, uh, online community of people that use osmosis. So if you type in osmosis uh, Google group, uh, here we go, we can search for that. And then you'll find that there are hundreds of analysts that, that use this tool and they're all quite friendly as well. So um, you'll see here, uh, this is a, these are just sets of questions and answers uh, and so on, and they're all very recent. So there's been some questions today, yesterday. Um, yeah, it's really quite active there. So that's that's available as a message of very, very similar. The starter data kit that was developed, you can use in the message model as well. There's no reason to use it in uh, osmosis. Uh, the message model comes from the International Atomic Energy Agency, and it's supported through their technical assistance programs. So there's no, um, um, let's say that there are two models that do more or less the same, uh, the same thing. Um, the difference is that osmosis is sort of completely open source at the moment. And, um, yeah, and that's about it. So we found Osmosis very useful because universities pick it up because universities like to um, be able to change code and do other things. There is, for example, a fellow called Dr. Bernard Tembo who um, developed a Zambian uh, osmosis model for his PhD at University College London, which I think is available and so on. So that's that's useful. But you know, message is exactly the same kind of tool. And my strong advice is that you know, don't switch tools if you don't need to. There's it, it's better to have you know strong competence in uh, in in one good thing than try and be split up into a lot of things if it's difficult to maintain a critical mass. Right, that said, um, they're both there. They both have uh, good support. Um, and you, your, all of the data that we've collected for osmosis for that starter kit can be used in message, can be used in Markel times, all of these types of, types of models. So the next question was, thanks for using the Zimbabwean example. We're finalizing our mitigation assessment for use in the NDC update. Ah, okay, no, great. And again, um, these kinds of tools can be used uh, for that. One thing with all of these, these, these tools is that uh, they can be simple and then as competence and so on builds, they can be really quite complex and so on. And um, it's the case that one of the reasons we produce this teaching material is that just important to be able to maintain knowledge knowledge management systems internally that can just be really important i think because in the past we've found that that could be that could be quite difficult so hopefully this 
this teaching material helps with that. And as I said, it's the case that um, we put this in there. There was some debate as to whether or not we put this in there. Is that when you when you finish the course, there, there are these little quizzes that you do, and at the end of it, you get a certificate, and it tells you what percentage you got at the end of that. So if you're in charge of a uh, a unit and you have new people coming in that need to learn about um, energy statistics or energy projections or modeling or uh, financing or electrification and so on, you can ask them, in fact, you can tell them to do the course and then say, ah, but you need to get over 50% or 80% or whatever you want to do um, for, uh, for me to know that you, you, you're on top of these tools and so on. And you can use them yourselves as well to understand where you're at with your understanding and 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 that sort of thing. And that can be that can be particularly useful. So we often have folk doing the course a couple of times so that they can come away and know that they've they've mastered uh, the first the first bits of these sorts of, of tools, which could just be handy because it is it is really having had teach myself how to use these tools from scratch with no assistance it is uh, it is difficult but hopefully hopefully these can be uh, these can be helpful okay so I suggest let's just take a two minute break okay so we'll start again at half past so that's one minute break right now just so you can stretch your legs and so on and then um, and then we'll get going again um martin asks uh is the osmosis course available for free yes all of the courses are available for free all of the software is available for free and it also comes with uh, support so the uh, irena tool that i mentioned flex tool comes with support from irena uh, the iaea tools that were mentioned come with support from the iaea and um, just like the osmosis tool, there are these communities that are being uh, developed. So you can you can go online and you may well find um, folk who are finding the same issues that you're having or otherwise, and just be able to uh, to connect with them and talk to them and share experience, which we found uh, very very helpful. It's also the case that um, every year we hold. Okay, it's been it's been messed up because of COVID, but that seems like it will be normalizing soon. Every year we hold a uh, an international teaching course together with uh, the IEA, IAEA, you know, UNDP, UNDESA, and others at uh, at a facility in Trieste in Italy, and then we have another one that happens in in different parts of Africa as well. So. Um, it's the case that you know do talk to whoever's involved in doing technical assistance work and those courses are there and they're uh, they run at costs so whatever it takes to cover the costs is what the, the courses are, are are run at okay so i uh, want to go through a couple of other tools quickly um and again we're not going to take a huge amount of time through these these are just introductions the next one, which I will spend less than five minutes on just introducing, is um, FinPlan, which is an IAEA tool. And the part of the reason why I won't spend more than five minutes introducing this is you have the world leader, um, Manuel Welsh, online, who um, uh, is in charge of the development of FinPlan and together with Oxford University. Uh, and others we put this teaching material uh together so again like the other tools this is there's a free course available online for free you get the certification for free but you do have to work to make sure that you get a decent grade because that comes on the certificate and um you can get access to the tool for free as well but basically bottom line is is that we need finance in order to get the investment for the tools that uh, uh that that, that we we need finance in order to get um, investment in the power plants and energy infrastructure uh, that that we require, especially if we want to transform from fossil fuels to some of these super cheap 
renewables that are, are coming along. And honest, honestly, the, the price of these renewables with the right guarantees in place can now be very cheap. Solar is being produced at one and a half uh, US cents. This is, this is really low. In fact, lower in some places uh, and so on. And the thing is, is that we have to, once we've used a model like osmosis and we figured out what investments are going to be most important, we can think about how to de-risk those investments so that they're attractive for people to invest in. And then we can think about how to, uh, to attract finance, uh, finance to those. And it's a case that lack of domestic capital, lack of domestic money to invest in these things uh, often causes real, uh, real problems. So there are things that, that we look at then. So we've identified the power plants and we need to think about the policies that are in place, the investment and financing structures and the legal framework. And with this tool, we can understand how to unpack that uh, really quite simply in order to get um, something sensibly put up in place. And remember, this time around, so you've built the model, you've looked at the best configuration of things. Now you want to look at it from the point of view of the person or the company, or otherwise that's going to be investing. If that investment is risky, they're going to want to spend their money somewhere else, or they're going to want to have very high returns. And if they want high returns, the price of the electricity will be high. If you can make it less risky by um, developing uh, sensible tariffs and other things. If it's less risky, then people are going to be willing to have a lower return on their investment. And if they have a lower return on investment, that means that the price of electricity is going to be lower and that means that you're going to grow faster. Um, it's really interesting. If you look back, the Industrial Revolution was pretty much caused by energy technology, the invention of a steam engine that could provide motive power and generate electricity and, and so on. And all of a sudden, it meant that certain things could be provided at a fraction of the cost. Energy, energy services just became cheaper. And as a result, countries with access to that technology and, and the ability to absorb it in their system developed faster. And so uh, by getting the right kind of financing, we can get the right sort of technologies in the system. And if they're modeled well and structured well, it just increases, uh, increases development. Okay, I'll just move on uh, through these. Important underneath all of this is making sure that the, the, the energy modeling, the planning has been important. And then they have a look at the, the project financing, more or less, uh, how would this be structured in a way that makes it attractive to an investor to, to come along? And then you can use this to go along and, and you can use this for different things. One, you can use it to go and attract investment. Another thing that you can do is you can use it to go and attract uh, support so that other people can take on some of those risks. And if they do that, and there are lots of risk facilities popping up, if they can do that and you understand where the financial risks are, again, you make it a, an attractive investment proposition. So um, um, an example that's interesting is Ethiopia did this quite cleverly and they've ended up with extremely cheap solar power plants being built. A number of other countries in Africa have not done this well, and exactly the same technology can cost three or four times uh, uh, three or four times the, the the price. Anyway, that's all I wanted to to go through uh, for the minute on on Finplan. Again, the um, all of the information and training and background and so on is on online for free, and it tells you about structuring your uh, capital, understanding where risks are, understanding various is uh, financial important and you can go through all of this so that uh, we can just understand what is needed for a better investment environment and again for some reason sometimes there are just disconnects between the energy ministry and the finance ministry or economics ministry and uh, this information is super super useful uh, if you want to um, I'm just going to share my screen again this information is super useful if you want to be able to, um, to understand what's missing. Um, you'll see in all, of these, in all of this lecture material, and this comes from the online material, uh, there, are, there are notes as well explaining everything that goes in the slides. So you'll be able to go through and unpack those 
uh, simply and easily. So if there are any questions about uh, FinPlan, please do ask those. And you can ask Manuel Welsh, who's on the call, who's the, the definitive FinPlan expert too. Otherwise, I'm going to move on then quickly to the last two tools that I want to go through fast. Okay, and these are uh, the Global Electrification Platform, which is another tool in, these, in the suite of tools that's available. As I say, all of these tools are available completely for, uh, for free. You have access to them. And there are various technical assistance programs, um, including this one, where you know, if there are certain things you want to jump into in more detail, um, support is available to do those. So the Global Electrification Platform is a really neat open source tool that helps us think about getting access uh, to electricity to folk quickly. Um, um, and there are different electrification options, right? If you want to get access to electri electricity to people, you can either connect them to the grid, develop mini grid systems or standalone uh, systems. And by the way, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of Europe and the United States, in fact, started off with mini grid systems and then developed uh, grid systems, which is a bit different to the way things are, are evolving in some parts of, uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, so, you know, the grid-based system is really good in that um, you can provide large quantities of electricity for lower prices, but the problem is, is that you need high demand centers for that to happen sensibly. Uh, mini grid systems are often useful if you're far from the grid, but you have a demand center, maybe like a dense village, or you've got some agricultural activity going on or some mining activity, and it's expensive to connect to the grid, but you can set up a, a smaller system. And so PV, mini hydro, wind systems, diesel generators, or combinations of these uh, can be used and important. I mean, you know, many... Many, many places, if you've got a hotel or something that is not grid connected, you'll have a little mini grid system with a diesel gen set uh, up and running. And then standalone options typically just boil down to PV with battery or, uh, or diesel generators. <laughs> so so um, I have a diesel generator because <laughs> I feel embarrassed about this. I'm supposed to be doing more sustainable energy and so on. I should have a, uh, a solar panel on my, on my, on my house, but I... I don't, I have a little diesel generator that I have handy just in case something, oh, a gasoline generator that I have handy if I want to go camping or do, or do other things. Uh, and there are various reasons for that. So those are the three, the three sort of options that you've got um, uh, available. And um, just to say, just to go back, it's the case that many parts of the world developed the electricity for systems first with distributed generation, um, uh, mini grid systems with pilot projects, and then they would roll these out. This is the, I think this is the United States, if I'm not mistaken, where they had lots of uh, uh, mini grid systems and then connected them into 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 grid systems. Um, this comes from various different different pieces of work that I won't go into. But what I'd like to do is to take you right now through to the global electrification platform. So this is something that we've developed again the teaching and everything else is available for free and what it does is it looks at a map of your country and every single settlement that's down there and then it will figure out what the cheapest way of getting electricity is to each one of those settlements and you can use this immediately for understanding what technology you need where how much to invest and for uh, different scenarios so the, there are different levels in this thing there's a thing called the explorer which uh, you can use to have a look at uh, about 200 different scenarios of electrification for Zambia. There's a thing called a generator. So you can go underneath the hood and change all of the assumptions and develop something that's completely, um, you know, fits what your, your purposes and needs are. And this has been used in studies for lots and lots of countries. So, um, um, the recent ones, Benin, Madagascar, Somaliland is being done right now, uh, Ethiopia, lots of countries have used this particular toolkit. Um, and this is, a, this is a picture of the architecture. So 
There's some analysis that happens, a database that develops scenarios. Uh, there are online tutorials. There's this teaching material. Uh, and underneath it all is a tool called Onset, the open source spatial electrification uh, tool. Um, I mentioned Zambia is in here. There are 59 countries at the moment, and we're using predominantly Onset as the, uh, as the model. And you can download everything and, and change everything and work with things how you would how you'd like to work with them. It's the case that we developed this for different, you know, different purposes. One is, is that you can download these different scenarios and talk to a high level decision maker or to an investor really quite quickly and start a conversation. And then after dig into the detail and figure out more on, on the electrification strategy. Uh, and it's also the case that you can engage with, um, you know, global development organizations. So the World Bank uses this. As soon as you engage to talk about electrification at the moment, the World Bank will use this as the first thing that it would look at. So here's a, an example of some of the analysis for Zimbabwe. This is from the Explorer. So this is the bit where 200 scenarios have been run and you can look through different scenarios. If you go to the generator, you can do your own scenarios with your own assumptions and so on, which is important. And in the training, you'll be taught how to do that. Um, you know, and this is a picture of electrification, which will tell you how much grid connection, how much uh, standalone, how much mini grid. So you'll see the, the standalone is the sort of light mustard color, and then there's a darker color for, for mini grids. Um, figure out exactly how much it will cost. So this is for the whole, the whole country. And you can see we have every single settlement put in here. And all of this data changes. So if you have better settlement information, you can just ship that in and rerun the results very quickly. Here are two different scenarios. Um, uh, on the left-hand side, you see I clicked uh, different things. So here's with a high population growth, a higher um, demand rate, and a higher solar costs than would be expected. Okay, and you'll see what happens is, is that there's a bigger investment in the blue stuff, that's grid. Okay, because all of a sudden the demand is bigger and so it makes more sense to connect to um, high density power sources and so on. So you'll see that uh, that change and you can play with various different scenarios too. And this can be useful. So you might be negotiating with China, for example, on PV systems and you'll be able to strike up a deal where you can tell them exactly how many PV systems you want, but you will want them at whatever cost makes sense for you. And so you can have different cost profiles and other things and use this as a, as a functional tool. In Malawi, people are using this to figure out, so as they get money in, where to invest next, because they can figure out where they get the best bang for their, uh, their buck and so on. So we'll end off there with that. Um, and I'd like to just take you online. Ah, oh, come back here. I have these, these icons that stop me from... Um, doing things. I'm going to stop sharing that. And then I'm going to share this, the um, internet, uh, my, my browser again. And if you type in global electrification platform in your browser, you'll come up with this, this particular thing. And so here you see uh, an example of uh, the global electrification uh, platform for Zambia, which you saw earlier on. And you can you can zoom in in different places um, and so on, and really go into quite some detail. So you'll see all of the various towns and subsettlements, for example, around Lusaka. And you can figure out, you know, what needs to be invested where. So let me just see if I can pick out just a random little settlement. I mean, that's not a random settlement, but just, uh, it's not letting me, there we go. So in a second, it'll, it'll tell me about this particular tiny settlement. And, you know, there's just, there's just two people here <laughs> that, that have been, that's why I think it's just a house or <laughs> something. And the, yeah, that looks wrong. I'm gonna move away from that quickly. <laughs> The point is, is that you can go into a lot of detail and, um, and, and download these maps. And it's the case that, um, oh yeah, this, the reason why this is wrong is that my, 
it's downloading large quantities of data. Anyway, so you can download these and then you can download the detailed maps uh, as well as well as all of the information that's that supports and is underneath this. Yeah, so you can see it's moving around the screen to where I had clicked on earlier. I just have a, my internet is taking a bit of strain uh, at the moment. So anyway, that's there and available uh, for free and as well the, um, the global electrification platform uh, to uh, teaching material is available for free as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing there before I go on to the very last tool and just ask if there are any questions or comments and so on on that. Okay, then I'm gonna move on to our last tool and just um, thank you everybody for, for bearing with for the two hour, uh, the two hour session where there's been a short introduction to a lot of different tools. The last tool that I want to introduce you to is something called CLUES. CLUES is short for the Climate, Land, Energy, Water um, System. Uh, it's also the case, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, Manuel, who's on this call, was involved in some of the, some core developments in CLUES, as well as with Osmosis. So you're very lucky to, uh, be working with them if you are working with them. Let's just uh, share this. So I have one question coming up. Can I add layers, other get tools to further explore other scenarios? Us, Nolwazi. So yes, absolutely. In the get, you can, and you go into the generator, you can take out all of the layers that are there. Uh, and you can put in your own layers. Uh, you can put in other layers on top as well. So what some people have done is they've looked at schools and clinics and so on and prioritized, uh, prioritized those. So in the get, you can do, uh, you can do exactly that sort, of, that sort of thing. Also, the get is a starting point. You, know, you can do many other more detailed things, but I think getting on top of the get really helps um, with um, getting to grips with the basics of, of electrification. So, you know, if nothing else, you'll be in a place to be able to be quite demanding with um, who you're working with and so on to, um, to either get better data so you can improve your data sets or for, um, you know, doing deals with technology providers and so on. All right, so very quickly, on to climate land and energy and water strategies. Um, so it's the case, so we've spoken about the energy system, and that's important, right? But energy is wound up with other systems as well, um, especially as it's the case that we have to, um, you know, we have to, uh, we have to get people food and water, and, you know, you need energy in order to produce food, you need energy in order to get water, people are short of food and water, and when there are times of drought, the gets exacerbated. So these things are really quite interwoven and they're interwoven with other sustainable development uh, goals. So as I say, agriculture requires water and energy. Uh, water requires energy in order to pump it, irrigate and so on. India, for example, uses something like between 20 and 30% of its electricity just to get water to its, its fields and so on for, for agriculture. Um, Energy requires, uh, agriculture requires energy. And as we look at biofuels as a potential feedstock, you know, there's this competition between land and energy. So there are all of these things and clues is just a way of helping you to, um, after you've done the energy system, to go into more detail and understand these other systems. So again, you can create consistent uh, policy because often policies are inconsistent and this can create, uh, this can create real problems. Um, Okay, I mentioned that already. I'm going to go through this really quite quickly. I'll miss this example, but you can get this online if you want to. Um, but, you know, to, to give you an example of policies that don't match up and cause problems, India, for example, it's got this province, Punjab, it it's got a small proportion of the country's land, but it produces most of the food for most of the poor people in India. So there are big government subsidies to make sure that this... Um, this place can produce um, 
can produce the food. However, it's the case that the water from the land is being taken out faster than it can be replenished. So uh, there are real problems. And this is because the way the government subsidizes it, as it says to the farmers, you can have free electricity so that you can cover your pumping costs. Okay. Problem is, is that with the free electricity, uh, you they pump out more water than is needed. So the water table drops, which means that they have to pump out, they use more and more electricity every year because they go deeper into the water table. This has a massive electricity bill. And at the same time, slowly it's degrading the land, which will cause problems. On top of it, India has problems trying to meet its power demand. So here's an example of an agricultural policy that is completely out of sync with the energy policy and causes real problems. And this happens in many, many different, uh, many, many different parts of the world. And the links are quite strong, right? So a large proportion of the fresh water we use is for agriculture. Um, we use a lot of water for either cooling or for hydropower uh, supply. In the case of Zimbabwe, in the work that we were doing, it was really interesting. And I'm sure it's probably similar in uh, Zambia in that at the time when there's not much water, people are trying to pull as much water out of the rivers as they can. But that then means that there's less water in the rivers to generate electricity at a time when people are demanding more electricity than they were demanding before. And there's this sort of vicious circle that is very, that can be difficult if things have not been uh, sensibly unpacked. And so like with the energy system, there are various factors that tell us how much water is being consumed for different um, uh, for different energy technologies, the same how much energy is used in different water processes, so for transporting and pumping and distribution and so on. And the same for how much energy and, uh, and water is used in, in land use. And just by getting all of these together in the same way as we did an energy balance, we can have a water balance and a, uh, a land use balance. And we do that in this sort of uh, uh, a picture here. This is a bit like your reference energy system that you saw uh, you saw earlier on. And um, in the clues model, underneath it sits a more complicated osmosis model. You can put this together. And we found you and Dessa use this a lot. And they found that um, being able to come to governments and help them develop integrated infrastructure strategies has just been really helpful. It can mean more resilience, it can mean lower cost, and it can mean less, less risky systems going into the future. Here are just some graphics from a recent study that um, were done, was done in a particular place, but you'll find that uh, a number of countries are using this officially. So Bolivia have got some really neat uh, stuff that you can, get, you can get offline and start working on, or start looking at and understand what they did. And there they wanted to maximize their agricultural production and understand what they should use for, for biofuel. And there the interesting thing is, is that you know, Bolivia is, is a relatively poor Latin American country. And so it really needs to use its assets very, very carefully. And yet sitting in the middle of government, there are folk running these clues models to figure out how to, um, how to work across different sectors. And this is really important. So not only do you spend the money that you, the limited money you have on the energy system well, but by integrating these different systems, you make sure that overall the money that you spend on development is uh, is well spent. All right, so that's that's it from myself. Um, are there any comments or questions uh, for now before we end off? Oh no, for some reason I can't hear you. Is that me? There we go. We have can you hear yes. I don't know, I could hear you for a second there. Okay, now can you? Yes. Can you, okay, perfect. Sorry for the technical issue. Um, 
Yes, now you can. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, we're, we're running out of time. It's a pity because we could have um, discussed much more all the different tools and topics you, you presented, Mark, but there will be follow up and, um, and uh, deepening sessions on all those, those topics uh, pretty soon. So thank you very much, Mark, for your time, your availability and for uh, having shared all, all this with the participants. Thanks to all of you for, um, for uh, bearing with us and uh, joining this uh, today's session. We'll, we'll meet again um, in, um, not tomorrow, but on, on Thursday. And uh, I really want to thank all of you and wish you a very good day. Right.